Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Ostara, Chloe, and Bella. As always, I want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy. Hit that like button, subscribe, and comment below. And today we're getting back to Homer again. And we're going to be getting there without further ado. Okay, we are on Homer's Odyssey once again. We are on book, let's see here, book 17, The Beggar at the Manor. We're getting close to the end, but then we've got another, let's see here, because we're not going to read the proscripts. Uh, let's see, right up to about another, oh. 150 pages, I'd say. 150 pages. So, yeah. This is a long... This one's about 20 pages, this this one is. Okay, so the beggar in the manor. Move that a little bit. When the young dawn came bright into the east, spreading her fingertips of rose, Telemachus, the king's son, tied on his rawhide sandals and took the lance that bore his hand grip burning to be away and on the path to town, he told the swineherd. Uncle, the truth is I must go down myself into the city. Mother must see me there with her own eyes, or she will weep and feel forsaken still, and will not set her mind at rest. Your job will be to lead this poor man down to beg. Some householder may want to dole him out a loaf and pint. I have my own troubles. Am I to care for every last man who comes? And if he takes it badly, well, so much the worse for him. Plain truth is what I favor. At once, Odysseus, the great tactician, spoke up briskly. Neither would I myself care to be kept here, lad. A beggar man faces, a beggar man fares better in the town. Let it be said, I am not yet so old and must lay up indoors and mumble I eye to a master. Go on then, as you say, my friend can lead me as soon as I have had a bit of fire, and when the sun grows warmer. These old rags could be my death, outside on a frosty morning, and the town is distant, so they say. Telemachus, with no more words, went out, and through the fence and downhill, going fast on the steep footing, nursing woe for the suitors in his heart. Before the manor hall, he leaned his face, he leaned his lance against a great porch pillar and stepped in across the door stone. Old Euryclea saw him first, for that day she was covering handsome chairs nearby with clean fleeces. She ran to him at once, tears in her eyes, and other maidservants of the old soldier, Odysseus gathered round to greet their prince, kissing his head and shoulders. Quickly then, Penelope the wise, tall in her beauty, as Artemis or pale gold Aphrodite, appeared from her high chamber and came down to throw her arms around her son. In tears she kissed his head, kissed both his shining eyes, then cried out and her words flew. Back with me. Telemaco is more sweet to me than sunlight. I thought I could, I should not see you again ever, after you took the ship that night to Pylos. Against my will, with not a word you went, for news of your dear father. Tell me now everything you saw. But he made answer, Mother, not now. You make me weep. My heart already aches. I came near death at sea. You must bathe. First of all, and change your dress and take your maids to the higher, highest room to pray. Pray and burn offerings to the gods of heaven, that Zeus may put his hand to our, to our revenge. I am off now to bring home from the square a guest, a passenger I had. I sent him yesterday with all my crew to town. Piraeus was to care for him, I said, and keep him well with honor till I came. She caught back the swift words upon her tongue. Then softly she withdrew to bathe and dress her body in a fresh linen, and make her offerings to the God of Heaven, praying Almighty Zeus to put his hand to the revenge. Telemachus had left the hall, taken his lance and gown, with two quick hounds at heel into the town. Athena's grace in his long stride, making the people gaze as he came near, and suitors gathered, primed with friendly words, despite the deadly plotting 
in their hearts, but these and all their crowds he kept away from. Next he saw, sitting some way off apart, Mentor with Antiphos and Helithersis, friends of his father's house in years gone by. Near these men he sat down and told his tale. Under their questioning, his crewmen, young Piraeus, guided through town, meanwhile into the square. The Argive exile, Theoclamenos, Telemachus lost no time in moving toward him. But first, Piraeus had his say. Telemachus, you must send maids to me at once, and let me turn over to you those gifts from Menelaus. The prince had pondered it and said, Piraeus, none of us knows how this affair will end. Say one day our fine suitors without warning draw upon me, kill me in our hall, and parcel out my patrimony. I wish you and no one of them to have those things. But if my hour comes, if I can bring down bloody death on all that crew, you will rejoice to send my gifts to me, and so will I rejoice. Then he departed, leading his guest, the lonely stranger home, over chair backs and hall. They dropped their mantles and passed into the polished tubs where maids poured out warm baths for them, anointed them, and pulled fresh tunics, fleecy cloaks around them. Soon they were seated at their ease in hall. A maid came by to tip a golden jug over their fingers into a silver bowl and draw a gleaming table up beside them. The larder mistress brought her tray of leaves and savories dispensing each. In silence across the hall beside a pillar propped in a long chair, Telemachus' mother. Spun a fine wool yarn, the young man's hand went out upon the good things placed before them, and only when their hunger and thirst were gone did she look up and say, Telemachus, what am I to do now? Return alone and lie again on my forsaken bed, sodden how often with my weeping. Since that day when Odysseus put to sea, to join the Atradia before Troy. Could you not tell me before the suitors fill out fill our house what news you have of his return? He answered. Now that you ask a second time, dear mother, here's the truth. We went ashore at Pylos to Nestor, Lord and Guardian of the West, who gave me welcome in his towering hall. So kind he was, he might have been my father, and I his long lost son, so truly kind, taking me in with his own honored sons. But as to Odysseus' bitter fate, living or dead, he had no news at all from anyone on earth, he said. He sent me over land in a strong chariot to Atreus' son, the captain, Menelaus, and I saw Helen there, for whom the Argives fought, and the Trojans fought as the go gods willed. Then Menelaus of the great war cry asked me my errand in that ancient land of Lacedaemon, so I told our story, and in reply he burst out, intolerable, that feeble men... I'm fit as those men are, should think, to lie in that great captain's bed. Fawns in the lion's lair, as if a doe put down her litter of sucklings there, while she sniffed at the glen of a gray, or grazed a gra or grazed a grassy hollow. Ha! Then the lord returns to his own bed, and deals out wretched doom on both alike. So will Odysseus deal out doom on these. O oh, Father Zeus, Athena, and Apollo, I pray he comes at once he was in Lesbos, when he stood up to wrestle Philomeletus, champion and island king, and smashed him down. How the Achaeans cheered. If that Odysseus could meet the suitors, they'd have a quick reply, a stunning dowry. Now for your questions, let me come to the point. I would not misreport it for you. Let me tell you what the Ancient of the Sea, that infallible seer, told me on... Oh, an island your father lies and grieves. The ancients saw him held by a nymph. Calypso in her hall, no means of sailing home, remained to him. No ship with oars and no ship's company to pull him on the broad back of the sea. I had this from the Lord Marshal Menelaus, and when my errand in that place was done, I left for home. A fair breeze from the gods brought me swiftly back to our dear island. The boy's tale made her, made her heart stir in her breast. But this was not all. Mother and son now heard. The O Ochlemes, the diviner, says he does not see it clear. O oh, gently lady, a gentle lady, wife of Odysseus, lay Erdides. Listen to me, I can reveal this thing. Zeus by my witness and the table set. The strangers in the hearth to which I have come. 
the Lord Odysseus, I tell you, is present now already on this island, quartered somewhere or going about, he knows what evil is afoot. He has it in him to bring a black hour on the suitors yesterday still at the ship. I saw this inopportant. I read the sign aloud. I told Telemachus, the prudent queen, la queen for her part, said, Stranger, if only this came true. Our love would go to you with many gifts. I, every man who passed, would call you happy. So ran the talk between these three. Meanwhile, swaggering before Dusty's hall, the suitors were competing at the discus throw and javelin on the left measured field. But when the dinner hour drew on and beasts were being driven from the fields to slaughter, as beasts were every day, Medon spoke out. Medon, the crier whom the suitors liked, he took his meat beside them. Man, he said, each one has had his work out and his pleasure. Come into hall now. Time to make our feast. Our discus throws more admirable than a roast when the proper hour comes. At this reminder, they all broke up their games and trailed away into the gracious timbered hall. There first they dropped their cloaks. They, there first they dropped their cloaks on chairs. Then came their timid. There came their ritual, putting great rams and fat goats to the knife pigs in a cow chew. So they made their feast. During these hours, Odysseus and the swineherd were on their way out of the hills to town. The forester had gone to them, started to say. Friend, you have hopes. I know of your adventures into the heart of town today. My lord wishes it so, no, not I. No, I should rather you stood by here as a garden, guardian of our steading, but I owe reverence to my prince and fear he'll make my ears burn later if I fail. A master's tongue has a rough edge. Of, off we go, part of the day is past. Nightfall will be early and colder too. Odysseus, who had it all timed in his head, replied, I know as well as you do. Let's move on. You lead the way, the whole way. Have you got a staff, a lopped stick you could let me use to put my weight on when I slip? This path is hard going, they said. Oh, there's Chloe. I know I saw her shadow. Over his shoulders, he slung his patched up knapsack, an old bundle tied with swine. Eumaeus found a stick for him, the kind he wanted, and the two set out leaving the boys and dogs to guard the place. In this way, good Eumaeus led his lord down to the city. And it seemed to him he led an out old outcast, a beggar man, leaning most painfully upon a stick, his poor cloak all in tatters, looped about him. Down by the stony trail they made their way, as far as Clearwater, not far from town, a spring house where the people filled their jars, Ithacos, Naritas, and Polycter built it and rounded on the humid ground a grove, a circular wood of poplars grew. He ice cold in runnels from a high rock ran the spring, and over there stood an altar stone. To the cool nymphs were all men going by laid offerings. While here the son of Dolius crossed their path, Melanthios, he was driving a string of choice goats for the evening meal with two gathered excuse me, with two goat herds beside him, and no sooner had he laid eyes upon the wayfarers than he began to growl and taunt them both, so grossly that Odysseus' heart grew hot. Here comes one scurvy type, leading another. God pairs them off together every time. Swineherd, where are you taking your new pig? That stinking beggar. There, liquor of pots. How many doorposts has he rubbed his back on? Whining for garbage, where a noble guest would raid a cauldron or a sword. Hand him over to me. I'll make a farm hand of him. A stall scraper, a fodder carrier, away for drink will put good muscle on his shank. No chance he learned his dodge as long ago. No honest sweat. He'd rather tramp the country begging to keep his hoggish belly full. Well, I can tell you this for sure in King Odessi's hall. If he goes there, footstools will fly around his head. Good shots from strong hands. Back inside, his ribs will catch it on the way out. And like a drunken fool, he kicked at Odessi's hip as he passed by, not even jogged off stride or off the trail. The Lord Odessi's walked along, debating inwardly whether to whirl and beat the life out of this fellow with his stick or toss him, brain him on the stony ground. Then he controlled himself and bore it quickly, not so the swineherd, seeing the man before him. He raised his arms and cried, Nymphs of the spring, daughters of Zeus of ever Odessi's, burnt you a thigh bone and rich fat. A ram's or kid's thigh bone, 
Hear me, grant my prayer. Let our true Lord come back. Let heaven bring him to rid the earth of these fine courtly ways. Melanthios picks up around the town of all wine and wind. Bad shepherds ruin flocks. Melanthios, the goat herd, answered. Bless me. The dog can snap how he goes on. Some day I'll take him in a slave ship overseas and trade him for a herd. Old silver bow. Paulo, if he shot clean through Telemachos and Hall today, what luck or let the suitors cut him down. Desi's died at sea, no coming home for him. She wants to come out. He flung this out and left the two behind to come on slowly while he went hurrying to the king's hall. There he slipped in and sat among the suitors beside the one he doted on. Eurymachos, then working servants, helped him to his meat, and the mistress of the larder gave him bread. Reaching the gate, Odysseus and the forester halted and stood outside the harp. Notes came around them, rippling, rippling on the air. As Femios picked out a song, Odysseus caught his companion's arm and said, My friend, here is the beautiful place. Who could mistake it? Here's Odysseus Hall in a hall like this. See how one chamber grows out of another, and how the court is tight with wall and coping. No man, no man at arms could break the gateway down. Your banqueting young lords are here in force. I gather from the fumes of mutton, roasting and strum of harping, Harping, which is the gods appoint, which the gods appoint sweet friends of feasts. And oh, my swine heard you replied, that was quick recognition, but you are no numbskull in this or anything. Now you must plan this action. Will you take leave of me here and go ahead alone? To make your entrance now among the suitors, or do you choose to wait? Let me go forward and go in first. Do not delay too long. Someone might find you skulking here outside and take a club to you, or I always love the word skulking. Take a club to you, or heave a lance. Bear this in mind, I say. The patient hero, Odysseus, answered, just what I was thinking. You go in first and leave me here a little. But as for blows and missiles, I am no tyro to these things. I learned to keep my head in hardship, years of war, and years at sea, let this new trial come. The cruel belly can you hide its ache. How many bitter days it brings. Long ships with good up stout planks athwart. Would fighters rig them to ride the barren sea except for hunger? Sea wolves woe to their enemies while he spoke. An old hound lying near and pricked up his ears and lifted up his muzzle. This was Argos, trained as a puppy for Odes by Odysseus, but never taken on a hunt before. His master sailed for Troy. The young men afterward hunted wild goats with him and hare and deer, but he had grown old in his master's absence, treated as rubbish now. He lay at Last one, a massive dung before the gates. Manure of mules and cows piled there until field hands could spread it on the king's estate, abandoned there and half destroyed with flies. Old Argos lay, but when he knew he heard Odessi's voice nearby, he did his best to wag his tail and nose down with flattened ears. Having no strength to move nearer his master, when the man looked away, wiping a salt tear from his cheek, but he Hid this from Eumaeus, then he said, I marvel that they leave this hound to lie here on the dung pile. He would have been a fine dog from the look of him, though I can't say as to his power and speed when he was young. You find the same good build in house dogs, table dogs, landowners, keep all, keep all for style. And you replied, Eumaeus, a hunter owned him, but the man is dead in some far place. If this old hound could... Low in the form he had when Lord Odysseus left him, going to Troy, you'd see him swift and strong. He'd never shrank from any savage thing. He'd brought to lay in the deep woods on the sand. No other dog kept up with him. Now misery has him in leash. His owner died abroad, and here the woman slaves will take no care of him. You know how servants are without a master. They have no will to labor or excel. For Zeus, who views the wide world, takes away half the manhood of a man that day he goes into captivity and slavery. Eumaeus crossed the court and went straight forward into the Megaron among the suitors, but death and darkness in that instant closed. The eyes of Argos, who had seen his master Odysseus after twenty years, long before anyone else, Telemachus caught sight of the gray woodsman coming from the door and called him over with a Quick jerk of his head, Eumaeus narrowed eyes, made out an empty bench beside the one the carver used. 
That servant had no respite carved, carving for the suitors. This bench he took possession of and placed it across the table from Telemachus for his own use. Then the two men were served cuts from a roast and a bread from a bread basket. And no longer interval, Odysseus came through his own doorway at, as a mendicant humped like a bundle of rags over a stick. He settled on the inner ash wood still, leaning against the door jamb, cypress timber the skilled carpenter planned years ago, planed years ago, and set up with plumb line. Now Telemachus took an entire lobe and a double handful of roast meat. meat. Then he said to the forester, Give these to the stranger there, but tell him to go among the suitors on his own. He may beg all he wants. This hanging back is no asset to a hungry man. The swine herd rose at once, crossed to the door, and halted by Odysseus. Friend, he said, Telemachus is pleased to give you these, but he commands you to approach the suitors you may ask all you want from them. He adds, your shyness is no asset to a beggar. The great tactician, lifting up his eyes, cried, Zeus aloft, a blessing on Telemachus. Let all things come to pass as he desires. Palms held out in the beggar's gesture. He received the, breast, the bread and and meat and put it down before him on his knapsack, lowly table. And then he fell to devouring it. Meanwhile, the harper in the great room sang a song, not till the man was fed, till the did the sweet harper and his singing, whereupon the company made the walls ring again with talk unseen. Athena took her place beside Odysseus, whispering in his ear, Yes, try the suitors. You may collect a few more loaves and learn who are the decent lads and who are vicious, although no, not one can be excused from death. So he appealed to them, one after another, going from left to right, with open palm as though his life time had been spent in beggary, and they gave bread for pity, wondering, though, at the strange man, who could this beggar be? Where did he come from? Each would ask his neighbor, till in their midst the goat herd, Melanthius, raised his voice. Hear just a word from me, my lords, who court our illustri illustrious queen. This man, this foreigner, I saw him on the road. The swineherd here was leading him this way. Who, what, or whence he claimed to be, claims to be, I could not say for sure. <laughs> At this, Antinous turned on the swineherd brutally, saying, You famous breeder of pigs, why bring this fellow here? Are we not plagued enough with beggars, foragers, and rat such rats? You find the company too slow at eating up your lord's estate. Is that it? So you call this scarecrow in, the forester replied. Antinous, well, well born you are, but that was not well said. Who would call in a foreigner unless an artisan with skill to serve the realm, a healer, a prophet, or a builder, or one whose harp and song might give us joy? All these are sought for the endless on the endless earth. But when have beggars come by invitation? Who puts a field mouse in his granary? My lord, you are a hard man, and you always were more so that others of this company hard on all of Desi's people and on me. But this I can forget, as long as Penelope lives on the wa on the wise and tender mistress of this hall, as long as Prince Telemachus. But he broke off at a look from Telemachus, who said, Be still, spare me a long-drawn answer to this gentleman. With his unpleasantness, he will forever make strife when he where he can and go the others on. He turned and spoke out clearly to Antinous, What fatherly concern you show me. Frighten this unknown fellow, would you, from my hall, with words that promise blows, may God forbid it. Give him a loaf. Am I a nigger? It's not the same word, by the way. No, I call on you to give, and spare your qualms on as to my mother's loss or anyone's. Not that, in truth, you have such care at heart. Your heart is all in feeding, not in giving. Antinous replied, What high and mighty talk, Telemachus. No holding you. If every suitor gave what I may give him, he could be kept for months, kept out of sight. He reached under the table for the footstool. His shining feet had rested on his, this. He held up so that all could see his gift. But all the rest gave alms enough to fill the beggar's pack with bread and roast meat. So it looked as though Odysseus had had his taste of what these men were like and could return scot-free to his own doorway. But halting now before Antinous, he made a little speech to him, said he, 
Give a mite, friend, I would not say myself. You are the worst man of the... She wants out. The young Achaeans, the noble is rather kingly by your look. Therefore, you'll give more bread than others do. Let me speak well of you as I pass on over the boundless earth. I, too, you know, had fortune once lived well, stood well with men, and gave alms often to poor wanderers like this one that you see, eyed all sorts. No matter in what die I want, I owned. Servants, many, God knows, and all the rest. That goes with being prosperous, as they say. But Zeus, the son of Kronos, brought me down, no telling why he would have it. But he made me go to Egypt with a company of rovers, a long sail to the south for my undoing. Up the broad Nile and into the river bank, I brought my dipping squadron. There, indeed, I told the men to stand guard at the ships. I sent patrols out, out of rising ground, but reckless greed carried my crews in away to plunder the Egyptian farms they bore off, wives and children killed, and what men they found. The news ran on the wind of the city, a night cry, and sunrise brought both infantry and horsemen, filling the river plain with dazzle of bronze. Then Zeus, lord of lightning, threw my men into a blind panic. No one dared stand against the host closing around us. Their skithing whip weapons left over dead in piles, but some they took alive into forced labor, my myself among them. And they gave me them to one Demeter, a traveler, son of Iasos, who ruled that Kypros. He conveyed me there from that place, working northward miserably. Oh, she's getting mad. But here Antinous broke in, shouting, God, what evil wind blew in this pest. Get over, stand in the passage, nudge my table, will you? Egyptian whips are sweet to what you'll come to hear. You nosing rat making you pit. To everyone, these men have bread to throw away on you, because it is not theirs who cares, who spares another's food when he has more than plenty. With guile, Odysseus drew away, then said, A pity that you have more looks than heart. You'd grudge a pinch of salt from your own larder to your own handyman. You sit here fat on others' meat. You cannot bring yourself to rummage out a crust of bread for me. That sounds typical of... Uh, Typical politician, well, not just politicians, but the greed in America and throughout humanity today. You know, they they begrudge their fellow men. You know, they have extra food. I mean, I think we're all, if someone's starving, and we're, we're kind of, if we have a little bit of extra, we're kind of obligated to give them a little. You might not feel that way, but. Spiritually speaking, as a human being, as a special fellow traveler in this world and in this universe, we're all obligated to help one another. And it will come back to you tenfold because the universe sees what you're doing and you get more. Greed never helped anyone. It just stifles off what the universe gives to you. It's just uh, God's way of finding out or the universe's way of finding out. Here we go. And off I go. <laughs> okay. Then anger made Antinous' heart beat hard and glowering on his brows. He answered, Now you think you'll shuffle off and get away after that impotence? Oh, no, you don't. The stool he left. Let hit, fly hit the man's right shoulder on the packed muscle under the shoulder's blade. Like rock, solid rock for all the effect one saw. Desi's only shook his head containing... Lots of bloody work as he walked on and sat and dropped his load, loaded bag again. On the doorsill, facing the whole crowd, he said and eyed them all. One word only, the lords and suitors of the famous queen. One thing I have to say, there's no pain, no burden for the heart. When blows come to a man and he defending his own cattle, his own cows and lambs, here it was otherwise, Antinous hit me for being driven on by hunger. How many bitter seas... Men cross for hunger. If beggars interest the gods, if there are furies, pent in the dark to avenge a poor man's wrong, they may, and then may Antinous meet his death before his wedding day. Then said Euphrates, son, Antinous, enough, eat and be quiet where you are, or shamble elsewhere. Unless you want these lads to stop your mouth, pulling you by the heels or hands and feet over the whole floor till you, your back is peeled. But now the rest are mortified. Someone spoke from the crowd of young bucks to rebuke him. Poor show that hitting this famished tramp bad business if he happened to be a god. You know they go in foreign guise. 
Kind of like angels in disguise. You never know who they are. <clears throat> the gods do it. Looking like strangers turning up in towns and settlements to keep an eye on mariners, good or bad. Isn't that what I was just saying? But as this notion, Antinous only shrugged Telemachus that the blow his father bore sat still without a tear. Though his heart felt the blow, slowly shook his head from side to side, containing murderous thoughts. Penelope, on the higher level of her room, had heard the blow and knew who gave it. Now she murmured, Would God you could be hit yourself, Antinous, hit by Apollo's bow, bow shot, and your Nomi, his, her housekeeper, put in, he and no other. If all we pray for her, for it came to pass, not one would live till dawn, her gentle mistress said, O oh, Nan, they are a bad lot, they intend to ruin all of us, but Antinous appears a blacker heart, hearted harm than any, here's a poor man, comma, wanderer, driven by, driven by, want to beg his heart, bread, beg his bread, and everyone, and Hall gave bits to cram his bag, only Antinous threw a st stool and banged his shoulder, most people are good. I mean, someday we all may need something. That's why we all should be there for each other. A team effort in the humans. The humanity is supposed to be a team effort. So she described it sitting on her sh in her shoulder among her maids while her true lord was eating. Then she called and the forester and said, Go to that man on my behalf, your males, and send him here so I can greet and question him abroad in the great world he may have heard. Rumors about Odysseus may have known him. Then you replied, O oh, swineherd, on oh, my queen. If these Achaean sprigs would hush their babble, the, the men could tell you tales from to charm your heart. Three days and nights I kept him in my heart him in my hut. He came straight off a ship, you know, to me. There was no end of what he made my, me hear. Of his hard roving, and I listened, eyes upon him, as a man drinks in a tale. A minstrel sings, a minstrel taught by heaven, to touch the hearts of men. At such a song, the listener becomes rapt. And still, just so, I found myself enchanted. By this man, he claims an old tie with Odysseus, too, in his home country, the Minoan land of Crete. From Crete he came, a rolling stone, washed by the gales of life this way, and that to our own beach. If he can be believed, he has news of Odysseus near at hand, alive in the rich country of Thesprotia, bringing a mass of treasure home. Then wise Penelope said again, Go call him, let him come here, let him tell the tale again for my own ears. Our friends can drink their cups outside or stay in hall, being so carefree, and why not? Their stores lie intact in their homes, both food and drink with only servants, not to take a little. But these men spend their days around our house, killing our beeves, our fat goats, and our sheep, carousing, drinking on hung up our good dark wine, sparing nothing, squandering everything. No champion like Odysseus takes our part. Ah, if he comes again, no falcon ever struck more suddenly than he will, with his son to avenge these outrage, this outrage. The great hall below, at this point, rang with a tremendous sneeze. Kachu from Telemachus, like an acclamation and laughter, seized Penelope. And quickly, lucidly, he went on, Go call the stranger straight to me. Did you hear that? He may owe my son's thundering sneeze at what I said. May death come of a sudden. So may death relieve us clean as that of all the suitors. Let me add one thing. Do not overlook it. If I can see this man has told the truth, I promise him a warm new cloak and tunic. With all this in his head, a forester went down the hall and halted near the beggar, saying aloud, Good father, you are called by the wise mother of Telemachus Penelope. The queen, despite her troubles, is moved by a desire to hear your tales about her lord. And if she finds them true, she'll see you clothed in what you need, a cloak and a fresh tunic. You may have your belly full each day. You go about this realm begging for all they give and all they wish. Now, said Odysseus, the old soldier, friend, I wish this instant I could tell my backs. To the wise suitor, excuse me, to the wise daughter of Icarios, Penelope. And I have much to tell about her husband. We went through much together. But just now, this hard crowd worries me. They are, you said, infamous to the very rim of heaven for violent acts in here. Just now, this fellow gave me a bruise. 
what had I done to him? But who would lift a hand for me, Telemachus, anyone else? No, bid the queen be patient, let her remain still till sundown in her room, and then if she will see me near the fire, inquire tonight about her lord's return. My rags of sorry cover, you know that. I showed my sad condition for first to you. The woodsman heard him out and then returned, but the queen met him on her threshold, crying, Have you not brought him? Why, why is he thinking? Has he some fear of stepping shy about these inner rooms? A hangdog, beggar. To this you answer, friend Eumaeus. No, he reasons that another might. And well, not to temper, to tempt my, tempt any sword play from these drunkards. Be patient, wait, he says, till darks, darkness falls. And oh, my queen, for you too, that is better. <sighs> better to be alone with him and question him and hear him out. Penelope replied, He is no fool, he sees how it could be. Never were mortal men like these for bullying and brainless arrogance. Thus she accepted what had been proposed, so he went back into the crowd. He joined Telemachus and said at once in a whisper, his head bent, so that no one else might hear. Dear prince, I must go home to keep good watch on hot and swine, and look on to my, look to my own affairs. Everything here is in your hands. Consider your own safety before the rest. Take care not to get hurt. Many are dangerous here. May Zeus destroy them first before we suffer. Telemachus said, you, Your wish is mine, uncle. Go when your meal is finished. Then come back at dawn and bring good victims for slaughter. Everything here is in my hand. Indeed, in the disposition of the gods. Taking his seat on the smooth bench again, Eumaeus ate and drank his fill, then rose to climb the mountain trail back to his swine, leaving the Megaron and caught behind him, crowded with banqueters. These had their joy of dance and song as day waned into evening. The end of book 17. Next video, we'll get into book 18. And we have about, uh, about 100 pages left to read, give or take. 130 pages. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And after we're done this, I've been saying it over and over again, we will be reading um, Alice in Wonderland. And then I'm thinking, because I've been getting a uh, big response on Pet Cemetery lately, I've gotten into Stephen King's The Shining after Alice in Wonderland. But have a great night. Stay safe and healthy. Till later.